You try to think about is. dealing with a, like a hundred thousand dollars in in college. Like, dude, I had to call my dad and ask for like gas money. I know. <laughs> I remember when oh I, my god! I remember when that I bounced. That shit was tough. I bounced yeah. in college, <laughs> dude. I, 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 I was like saltine crackers and ketchup, oh, dude. dude. I bounced my bank what? account for a can of snuff one time. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours, but the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm-hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack spray and that since escalated to these 40 or 60 uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost check out deer grow at deergrow.com <laughs> and we're back yeah no i'm ready okay seriously 100 podcasts <laughs> Episode 126, Nick keeps us in line on that. Ew. We were just, uh, Jared was doing a little pre-podcast prep here, uh, reciting some sports movies right, right, right. for our guests. Run it, run it on through here. Yep, yep. Don't get him, don't get him crossed over or confused. You know? <laughs> I definitely will. Yeah. You're like, was that Denzel Washington coaching Miracle? No, it was not. It was Kurt <laughs> Russell. So um, it is, I don't know, I'm going to watch, what is it? May 4th? May yeah. 5th? I think it's the f- Fourth. fourth. It's the fourth. It's yeah. early May. Oh, yeah. May the May the fourth be with yeah. you. I yeah. saw that Star many Wars times day. today. Right? Star Wars Day. May the fourth be with you. <laughs> yeah, Jared's classic hand sadness signal. What's tomorrow? Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo is tomorrow. Mm. Saturday's Kentucky Derby. I'll be mm. at it. Uh-huh. And uh, That's a horse race, correct? <sighs> Officially? <laughs> Wow, when he where, said where they I race don't know horses, sports, <laughs> he's really off. Yeah. Yeah. Like they race the horses still at the correct, combined, right? Yes. Nobody on them, or no? Yes, jockeys. Jockeys. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, boy. We'll have to give him a real rundown at some point. Right. Yeah. And, you, and people still what'd bet you think on they that. Did? Right? Like That's bet on deal? bet on people. No, I knew it was horses. <laughs> yes, and jockeys on them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, are there any other horse races like still? Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's they still race horses. Yes. Okay. But I mean, it's so like the Did Kentucky you know? Derby oh, is a singular race in the day, but there are 13 races that happen at Churchill Downs during the day. Gotcha. So like you're there all day um, waiting for the Derby, which is around six, seven o'clock, something like that. Um, that sounds like the name of a slow country singer. What's that? Churchill Downs. Churchill Downs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Jared, not sports, not country. <laughs> I don't know what we're we're gonna do with them. You see, deer, he Mor- knows deer. Yeah, I know. Oh, I see. I keep up that Morgan Wallen. I saw just rescheduled a bunch of bunch of shows or something. Oh yeah. yeah. I, see, I don't keep up with the new stuff. Well, as much. I think he was too drunk for one, mm. and so they canceled it. That'll like, happen. People were there and they canceled it. Oof. But but I guess there's more because he lost his voice. Oof. That's what they're saying. Yeah, well, we t- was it a couple of weeks ago we talked about how like guys like Morgan Wallen kind of fell out of into obscurity and then like all of a sudden he's yeah. back. Yep. Yeah. You know, yep. like lost records deals and everything and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yep, he's back. Yeah. yeah. He they, was they one just of them. realize it like, oh, this guy will still make money for us. Yeah. His fan base is just like It's just a money play. Yeah. 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 Well, it's May. Um we got some corn in the ground. I got corn in the ground um before rain so we'll see how that's going we were just talking soil samples a little bit earlier Dude, i can't believe how much rain we've got oh it's just just like been, fast four days yep we've got beans coming up uh so we're kind of planning for the stages of getting beans in the ground um i mean I've, dude i think if, if people didn't catch that last one maybe nick we can do like a little clip on or something but that uh that time re uh time released uh stabilized nitrogen fertilizer yeah with, with mm-hmm. nitrogen in it that um Eric Hansen was telling mm-hmm. us about last week. That's a that's a big deal. Huge. If anybody's like renting uh, or has like a either a Genesis or a tar rail or tar uh, river or yep. if, or if you're renting a a, a no till drill like from the county or something, which is what I do. Mm-hmm. You know the problem is the reason you rent the drill is so that you can drill right into un, unplowed ground. Yeah. Um, but that also doesn't give you an opportunity to work in any fertilizer. Yeah. So that time released, you know, uh, 
ESN is what ESN is they were saying. Yeah, definitely check that out. You know, I'm gonna ask my co-op. It about said it. It, it's harder to find, um, but obviously in terms of you know having it out there and having that timed release versus essentially it's kind of a one shot and gone and you're gonna lose a lot of it if you just especially top dress it on the soil. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a big piece of it. Um, you know, I did, I used Waters Ag, which is, they have a couple different offices, but the one I used was in Kentucky to do my Ohio and Kentucky soil samples. Super responsive, really nice report. Um, so just good to understand kind of what you're working with. You're on like, that. oh, this is not looking so good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no. Yeah. No, I was talking. surprised. I mean, we, we talked about, um, the new Kentucky farm I bought and a lot of that, uh, area is just old pasture, which Eric kind of said, Hey, you know, you probably are in pretty good shape there because you didn't have crops in there consuming the nutrients as much. I was more worried about the pH because I have a lot of, um, broom sedge that showed up And a common trend is if you see that broom sedge, uh, going up, then it's either nutrient deficient or it's really acidic soil. Mm. But like I told you, most of my pHs were six, five, six, eight. So like, that was awesome to know that. Now I've still got to make, I think it's because my phosphorus was so low that I have that broom sedge. So there's still some things I need to add into that soil. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's crazy, man. It seems like it's really flying now. Like we're going to have beans in the ground soon. And, you know, next thing you know, you're going to be, you know, scouting velvet giants here, hopefully soon. Rocking. Yeah, I said Sunday I'm going to get up and try to turkey hunt. I'm going to check on those clover pots that I planted. Uh, I got to get that... Uh Whatever we end up doing with that fertilizer, I got to get that ordered and get our beans in. And mm -hmm. yeah, next couple of weeks, you know, towards the end of this month, we'll be getting it in. So we've got a guest today. Pretty stoked on my side. This was kind of the pre podcast we were talking about, Jared getting his sports references uh, in check. Um, but we've got Trey Waynes on the podcast. So, Trey, um, former NFL guy from Cincinnati Bengals and Minnesota Vikings, uh, cornerback. Um, so, do I need to break any of that down for you? I we got okay it. so far? Cornerback, yeah. Corner, not quarter, <laughs> corner. I'm with you. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so Trey is a guy, there was a press release put out by Minnesota Vikings not too long ago that basically talked about Trey um, investing in a lot of property in, uh, in particular, Buffalo County, Wisconsin area uh, and doing outfitting and stuff. And so... You know, I know we've had a lot of conversations, especially around the outfitting side. So it'll be cool to get Trey's kind of input there um, just in terms of, you know, the amount of land you need. And then how do you play that fine balance between, you know, deer herd management and, and business, right? And hunting business as, as an outfitter. Um, but also just to kind of hear, you know, Trey's story, because I think we've talked to, uh, well, Kevin Smith played in uh, major leagues. We talked to a lot of the guys at the pro sport level who, um, definitely love to hunt and fish, own property. You know, Adam LaRoche, obviously from Buck Commander. Um, but there's there's kind of a stigma around it in the general public, too, to where, you know, hunting sometimes is not looked at as the most favorable thing. Um, and so it'll be interesting to kind of hear Trey's standpoint of that, of, you know, how people reacted when they heard, you know, he was a hunter. Um, and then even, like, some of the teammates and people he knew in the NFL, you know, it's almost you kind of got these closet hunters out there on the pro sports level just because sometimes it isn't looked at so favorably in in the main media eye mm -hmm. um so i thought it was cool when when that press release came out from the vikings that you know it was kind of like oh like he's he's kind of all in on this thing too gotcha well and he's not playing anymore either right correct correct well, yeah so anyways get trey in and let's roll what's going on man Hey, how you doing? All right, buddy. I appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. So, Trey, you know, I guess kind of out of the gate, um, and maybe even for Jared because he's not the, the sports guru <laughs> of the group, but it, I think it'd be cool to kind of start just even uh, a little bit on your background, and I kind of let up there pre-podcast a little bit, you know, obviously on the NFL side, but uh, from a collegiate level, you were at what, Miss, uh, Michigan State? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I was saying, <laughs> you almost really offended I almost there. said Mississippi State, but that's where I was at. So, you're at Michigan State. You're a Big Ten guy. Um, obviously, kind of the hunting and land side for a lot of us, you know, it, it's an interesting story of kind of where do you where do you get into it? Where do you come from? Did you hunt and fish growing up? Um, hunted? No. Nobody in my family like hunted. There, it's not something that. 
um, they were really for. Not saying that they were just like anti hunting, but I mean, they were kind of like, oh, like, you know, we're not going to shoot or kill animals, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but they were never against it. It's not like they shunned people who did it. It was just something that, you know, they just didn't do. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that stemmed from, uh, you know, where my grandparents lived. Um, they live in a very small town in Illinois called Sisson Park, population probably like 300. Um, <clears throat> but out there, you know, I, I, uh, I grew up going there a lot. And, you know, I think that, you know, helped spark my interest in, you know, the outdoors because they had, I think it was like a 30 acre farm or something like that. And, you know, they had like woods and, you know, cricks and stuff like that. And I, you know, loved just being outside, being out, you know, being in the outdoors and, um, you know, out there, you know, it's unfortunate because, you know, I'm kind of going off topic, but it, it goes together, but, um, you know, they, they see a lot of deer. But in their, God, I think it's 40, 50 plus years living there. And they, they have, you know, corn fields. They have all that stuff. They have their own, you know, corn and fields that they that they plant. They've never found, you know, a shed. Really? Not once. And, you know, I was just blown away when I heard that. And they were like, yeah, people like down here, you know, their theory is if it's brown, it's down. So they don't you know, really get past, you know, two years old at that and stuff like that. And, you know, it was kind of a cool experience because where our outfits at, you know, I brought them down there for our, one of our shed hunting tournaments and, you know, they just couldn't believe how many, you know, sheds we found within, you know, a day, which was over 200. Um, and they've never found one, you know, being where they they were in over 50 years. Um, so I think that's kind of why, you know, they, you know, don't really, aren't really fans of hunting just because of where they're at and how they see it being done. Um, but I mean, we, we, we definitely grew up fishing, um, you know, not huge fishers, but you know, it's something we, we, we did. And, you know, my uncles and grandpa, they were fishing bass tournaments and stuff like that. And, you know, I would go here and there, but you know, it's kind of hard when you're fully committed to, you know, sports and stuff like that, you kind of miss out on a lot of stuff, but, um, you know, fortunately, when I went to Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, uh, we ended up living on a lake. So that was one of the things I did consistently after practice or, you know, in my off days, I would just go on the boat or go off the dock and just fish because it was just something I really enjoyed. So obviously you were, you know, being at your grandparents' place, like you had that rural kind of experience to, to the farm country of mm -hmm. Illinois and stuff. At what point in time did you actually start to say, you know, hey, I want to go hunt? Well, that, that just goes back to what I said before, like, you know, once you're in sports and certain athletics, like you don't really, and if you're really committed to it, you don't really have time to do yeah, anything there's no else, time. which is one thing. No, well, cause hunting seasons are in football season for That's one. It, man. So I was like, that was never really an option, but you know, at an early age, I had an appreciation for it. And I always watched like, you know, the hunting channels and stuff like that. And <laughs> it was something I always wanted to do and try. Um, you know, I'm not one of those people that just shoot shit to shoot it. Um, but it's something, you know, I appreciate it and I respect it and something I always wanted to do and try, just never really had the opportunity to just because, you know, football time and, commitment. you know, that's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that was one of the reasons why I, I also walked away not saying it was the only reason, but it's like, when you play, you know, in the NFL, you don't really have time to do much. <laughs> I mean, yeah. even in the off season, you're training, you're, you know, working out, you're just staying on your, you know, consistent diet. It's just, it's a lot. And I don't think a lot of people really realize the commitment and how much time we really put into, you know, playing this game. Yeah. I think it's interesting because if you look at like, um, the sports mentality of things, and I don't, I can't remember who we talked about with this previously, but uh, to me, there's a, a really strong link between those of us who were in sports and around sports in our life or workout or whatever, and the success side of hunting. Like you just basically pick that drive up that you had during sports and that lifestyle. And now you just apply it to the hunting side. Yeah. I mean, you definitely can do that. Um, <clears throat> like I, I tell people all the time, well, now that I'm retired, like I, I'm retired, but I, I don't feel like I'm retired. Like I feel like, you know, I'm just as busy, but now I'm just busy doing stuff. Like I actually want to do and enjoy, um, I mean, because what was it last week? I had to cancel because we were filming for, yep. um, you know, our TV show. And actually, today I was supposed to fly there 
today and film for another episode for the show. Uh, but you know, other things came up, but it's like, I'm just as busy and, um, you know, you've really got to put in the work and time and effort to, you know, get the results you want. And I mean, even that's with, you know, food plots, that's with, you know, strategy designs, even, you know, the hunting part itself, like you can't just walk out there and shoot your bow or shoot your gun and expect to hit something. It's like, you actually got to be committed and take the time to practice and, you know, own that craft. Yeah, no, I think that's huge. The one thing that I, I thought was kind of cool in terms of reading that article from the Vikings is it seems like a lot of guys have a, uh, a difficulty letting go of the game and not saying that you didn't either, but you know, I think, yeah, (laughs) well, but I think to, to your point, like you realized at some point that there were things that you wanted to do and, and essentially the league was kind of keeping you from it. And I'm sure family is also Mm. part of that too. Yeah. Um, geez. Okay. Well, yeah, like I'll start with the family aspect. The family aspect was hard because, you miss everything. You know, I, you know, I've missed Christmas, Thanksgiving, like birthdays, you name it. Like I, I've missed all of those things for the past, you know, 10 years, you know, cause college too. And you know, like, it was funny, like my best friend, Melvin, he still plays, uh, this, this is like this year, my birthday was always in, it's in, it's on July 25th. And that was usually when the start day or we already were in camp by mm-hmm. then. So I never got to celebrate a birthday in the past 10 years because of college too. But, you know, he had called me. He's like, dude, like, what are you going to do for your birthday? <laughs> like, you actually get to celebrate. I'm like, I have no fucking clue. Like, I haven't <laughs> been able to celebrate it over the last 10 years. Like, I just want to relax. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I want to do. want to relax and have a glass of whiskey or something. But, you know, like I said, holidays, birthdays, you name it. And it's like, especially when you have kids, that's when it gets hard because it's like you're always missing everything sure and then so that so that was a big thing for me um and then what was the other question it was something about just, guys have other passions or something yeah or? well i mean it just seems like they have a tough time letting go of the game and i get it oh yeah, yeah. you know because you, you've been doing it your entire life you've been working to be the best your entire life mm-hmm. it's just you know everybody always says <clears> like for example there it's the life after football like what is life after football yep. and i think a lot of these well, guys I was excited for it you were yeah and like for me i didn't i realized early in my career that um you know as much as i loved the game of football i hated the realities that came with it and you know a lot of people don't realize what those realities are and you know it's the injuries it's the time it's the commitment it's you know all the things you miss out on it's it's a lot of things that people that don't play sports, especially professional sports, don't see. And, you know, I, I realized it was, it was just a business. And it was like, you know, I, I, I got sick of putting, you know, my body on the line and my health on the line for somebody else to make money. And, yeah, like, we, we make good money. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, it's like we play a really fucked up brutal sport, if you think about it. And, you know, if you, you saw like the, the DeMar Hamlin situation, yep. he almost died on the field. And, you know, Demarius Thomas, he passed away a couple of years ago at like the age of 33 or something yep. like that. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of these guys and former players that, you know, are really struggling after the game. And like, like I said, a lot of people, they don't see that. Um, you know, I, I've seen countless coaches that have played and, you know, they're hobbling around, barely walking and, you know, they're spending, you know, nights and all their days like watching film or at at the office and stuff like that and it's like you know that's not something i wanted to do because at the end of the day it's like i got to look out for me and my family it's like yeah do we get set up you know pretty well financially yeah some do but the reality is 90 percent of the guys that play aren't in that situation Mm -hmm. and it's like my thing is like well if something were to happen to me like what what's the rest of the world going to do oh go on twitter and prayers for Trey and his family and that keep it moving. So it's like, you know, at the end of the day, it's like I had to do what was best for me and my family in the long run. And fortunately we made enough to, you know, be comfortable and I was able to walk away uh, when I did and when I wanted to on my own terms, which is something I always wanted to do. But that's also why we started the uh, outfitting business too, while I was playing. So when I did retire, we still had cash flow coming in from other avenues. Yes. So okay. how old are you Trey? And, and how long did you play? Uh, I'm 30. How long did I play in the NFL or total? 
the NFL. <laughs> yeah, uh, or I guess, weird. yeah. Uh, what, what age did you get into the NFL and how long yeah. did you play there? Well, I, I played in the NFL for seven years. I've been playing football since I was like fucking 10. So, yeah. Yeah. So, got into the NFL when you're what, like 20, early 20s? Uh, how long you been yeah. out? I This was my first year. Okay. Uh, so, it started when you were like 22? Yeah. Ish, yeah. I, I think what's interesting about it, man, and you kind of touched on it there, is like, um, and this is like obviously probably a big stereotype on on the professional sports side, and so I'd, I'd love to hear your take on it. But, you know, you at some point during the pro career, you realize there is going to be a life after football, and so you did things like the outfitting business to understand income. Do you see a lot of other guys thinking forward like that in the league? No. Man, you know, it's unfortunate. Um, it's starting to trend in that direction now. Um, but, you know, when I got into the league, again, I can't speak for everybody, but sure. just from what I've seen, um, no. But, you know, now, more recently, I, I am seeing that. But when I got in the league, I didn't see that. And that's kind of why I started, um, you know, planning ahead. Just because, you know, when I when I first got into it, I saw a lot of guys – you know, get in bad financial situations or, you know, not or getting taken advantage of and just, you know, just not really being aware, educated of some of the things they were doing. But, you know, as of the last couple of years, you're starting to see that trend, you know, go upwards in the fact of people are being more proactive with, you know, their money while they're in the league and starting other businesses and getting, you know, just more more hands, you know, in other areas outside of football. Did you have somebody that was kind of like a mentor and advisor on that side or somebody that tipped you off to say, Hey, you know, you should start thinking about, you know, doing something smart with this money. Um, I wouldn't, yes and no. Like, you know, I had a financial guy for a little bit until he passed away, but, um, you know, he was a family friend and, you know, he was one that, you know, he, Again, I was never like that, but he never really or would let me spend with outside of my means or spend on, you know, stupid shit. And um, you know, I was never like that anyways, but, you know, he was also that kind of guy. Yeah. Um, and every time I had, let's say, a business idea, I would always run it by him first. Like, hey, like, you know, can you do some research on this? Can you run the numbers? And I would get his advice on it um, just before I really made any kind of major decision. I guess my question is, is why land, you know, would you look at that as like a, a financial investment or was that more of like a, you know, just, uh, you know, getting back to the, the 30 acres you had access to when you're younger, like, man, I just want to have a place. You know, how did that all kind of start? Um, <clears throat> okay. Well, I'll just answer the question. Cause I mean, the start as a whole nother story, but <laughs> yeah, it's an investment. Yeah. Um, you know, Initially, really like that was the, that was the mindset. It will create. Initially, yeah, you're like I mean, investment. I don't want to share it because it will create more competition. But <laughs> I mean, think about it. Like, what's the one thing you can't make more of? Uh, I know, it, man. Yeah, we that's why cats it. out of the bag, dude. I mean, yeah, yeah. people now. You know, yeah. So it's like, yeah, I know people are starting to figure that out now. But it's like, you know, when the stock markets are down and stuff like that. Well, that's not affecting, you know, yeah. my land investment. It has nothing to do with it. Yep. And, you know, as long as you don't destroy it, it's going to keep going up in value. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think so, you've, seen, I mean, you've seen some other people do it. Like, I don't know if it was, was it like Brady and Gronk's group recently started investing some ag land in like Iowa and, and things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are other people that are, you know, at that pro level starting to see the value of, of owning land. Um, you know, one, it appreciates. Well, people have always seen the value of, of owning land. I mean, I, like at one time, like that's all that mattered. Like yeah, you, you could vote owner. unless you owned land, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, but it's, yeah, it's funny how people kind of forget that throughout phases of, of, uh, like history, but you're right, dude. They, even since that time, they haven't made any more of it. Yeah. You know, and they, it ain't ever going to happen. Yeah. And I think from the sports side of things, if you think about it, like, you know, you're in Minneapolis and stuff like when you're in these, you know, more major metropolitan type things, it's not like, oh, my land's right there. Like you've mm -hmm. got a little bit of a drive to wherever you're investing in it. So just maybe it's not on top of mind for a lot of these guys because they're playing in like a major metropolitan area. Well, so I guess the next question is because you, you answered why land. The next question is why Buffalo Co County, Wisconsin? Well, you guys are hunters, so you should know the answer. Okay, well, I do, yeah. But so there was definitely some like <laughs> re re some recreational motivation. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it just made smart business sense. So what initially happened was um, we started, and with the help of, you know, my business partner and, you know, a good friend, you know, because I had talked to him about, you know, investing in certain things, and he had brought up the idea of land because we were looking into real estate. He was like, well, why don't you do land real estate? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, you know, was kind of ignorant to that whole idea at first. I really didn't have too much you know, background on it. But, you know, Buffalo County, you know, the original plan was we were just going to get farmland, you know, for dirt cheap, renovate it, improve it, uh, and sit on it and then liquidate after a couple of years. Yep. And, you know, part of that process was because we were going to turn it into prime hunting land and Buffalo County is already, you mm-hmm. know, one of the white tail meccas in the country. So what we did is we would just <clears throat> start buying up all this land and, you know, part of that is you'd have to hunt it to show the genetics and what kind of deer are on it and, you know, document all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we would just have, I, I would never have time to do it. I think I maybe went like twice. And what I would do is I would go up Monday after meetings, hunt Monday night, hunt Tuesday morning, drive back to Tuesday evening to go to practice Wednesday. Jeez. So it was like, you didn't really, I didn't really have time to do it. So what we would do is we'd have a couple of our buddies go up there and hunt and so we could document you know, the kind of deer that were on these farms and stuff like that. And then I came up with the idea. I was like, well, as we started getting more and more farms, I was like, dude, why don't we just start an outfit, you know, mm-hmm. and make money on the side while we're, you know, looking at the bigger picture for just liquidating in the end. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I convinced him to, you know, leave his very, very well paying job. And, you know, he <laughs> was really climbing up, but now he's basically running the show there. And I'm now that I'm retired, um, you know, I can be more involved, but you know, it just exploded. Um, you know, he, he's a diehard hunter, you know, he lives for the outdoors, but you know, I was able to convince him that I was like, dude, like we could have something here with your knowledge and expertise and, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, we started the outfit and I mean, it just exploded. I mean, we knew we would have success. We just were surprised at how fast we mm-hmm. did. Um, you know, cause we didn't start in this, we never anticipated having, you know, all these sponsors and, you know, TV shows and everything else we're doing. And I mean, now, you know, I, I would consider us, you know, top five in the country. So I think it's really cool in that, you know, we, we've talked about the outfitting side a lot, um, you know, and, and how difficult for a lot of people who let's say don't own farms or purely like leasing farms, it is to make a business out of that. Um, and, and I get it from a year to year standpoint, but also, you know, it seems like you guys are, are looking at that from year to year, but the long-term gain of having these farms, managing these farms, you know, producing quality deer on them and eventually, you know, liquidating them for probably a substantial profit to what you bought them. You know, all of those things work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just for example, like we bought our first farm for I think it was like 3,500 an acre. Mm-hmm. Um, we just had someone offer us 11.5. Holy <laughs> cow. I mean, we didn't, we didn't sell it, but I'm just saying that's the progression it took. And Jeez. You know, not, not to sound like cocky or anything, but I think a lot of that had to do with what we did. Yeah, um, I'm sure it did. Because like you said, a lot of people lease and stuff like that. And, you know, we lease a couple farms here and there, but you got to think about it in, you know, this aspect of it, you're not going to improve a house that you don't own. Yeah, sure. You know what I'm saying? So you're leasing all these farms, like that's great, but you're not going to spend the money on, you know, food plots, trail system, watering holes. Like you're just going to hunt the shit out of it and hope it's it's not an asset that you own. Yeah. Yeah, no. And you know, that's where we come in and we kind of change the game because we skyrocketed the value uh, like in Buffalo County, probably way sooner. Like it was already trending that way, but I think we just sped it up because of what we were doing. And, you know, just an example, we have a property co- we call the 500. Well, I mean, w- and what it was, it was 500 acres of just timber. Like mm-hmm. it, it was nothing but fucking trees. And yeah, like people can afford to, you know, go buy that, but do they have the money to then turn it into, you know, a whitetail mecca farm and, like, do they have the vision and, you know, the resources to do that? Yeah. And it's like, and that's where, 
you know, I think we thrive because we have, you know, the guys on our team that have that vision to, you know, draw up these designs, create these, these designs, you know, that just tailored for whitetail and the hunters. And, you know, I think that's, that's what, you know, really helps, you know, skyrocket what we were doing. Do you think um, when you start to look at some of these farms, do you have a a kind of a thought process in mind of like, hey, we want to hold on to this thing for four years and then start to look to sell? Or are you just kind of playing the market and, and, you know, I I say milking the property, but that isn't necessarily what I mean. But, you know, just using the property as long as you can. Um, Yeah, I mean, we have we have a business plan and, um, you know, we we're not looking to sell, but. Um, you know, one of the partners we have is Weiss Realty down there. Yep. And, you know, they, they are constantly coming to us about people that are trying to, you know, just purchase our farms and they're they're not even for sale, but, um, you know, we have sold a couple, um, just because, you know, the number was almost too good. Yep. You know, I mean, even though it wasn't for sale, but we've also had some deals to where we've sold properties, but then we've we've sold we've sold the property but we negotiated um like a 10-year lease on that same farm so it's like we sold it but we can still hunt on it yep like it's like it's still our own so it's like there's a lot of ways that you can go about negotiating and you know acquiring farms but yeah we're not looking to sell any anytime soon but we have sold a couple just because of certain situations and then i guess from like a another annual revenue source i assume you guys are cash renting the the tillable land on on those farms Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. obviously yeah we we have certain uh deals in place with farmers like we'll let them farm it and um you know we'll pay them a little bit to leave standing in corn or something like that it just all depends on the farm yep and then obviously timber being able to remove timber Mm -hmm. for for well yeah yeah so we actually, I mean, that's another form of income that we have, um, you know, logging. So we, we had a deal with a logging company, like for the 500. Um, I mean, I don't know if you want me to say numbers, but we have a three year deal with them to where they come and log, you know, specific trees in certain areas and they write us a check for it. Yep. But it's like all strategically done to where we want it and where, where we want them to do it. So it's not hurting you know, the habitat for the whitetail is just, you know, improving it. I think, yeah, I think that's a big thing. We talked about that with Eric last week is that as the landowner, right, you have a lot of ability to control the situation. I think a lot of people think, you know, oh, well, I need to cave into the farmer here, the timber guy here. And it's like, listen, dude, it's your freaking land. Like at the end of the day, right. whatever they do, you got to live with. So, you know, stand your ground and make sure it's done right. And listen, if they're not going to be conducive to what you want, then it's not the right deal for your property. It's just how it is. Yeah, and I mean, you get you get in certain situations. It's like you also don't want to, you know, have any bad blood, especially in these yeah. small like yep. you know towns and stuff like that, where everybody knows everybody. So it's like you want to try to do something that favors the both parties. But sometimes, you know, you do have to stand your ground, like you said. But you also don't want to, you know, ruffle any feathers either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, dude. For perspective, like how how big is the the outfit operation? Like how many guys are you running through there? Like I don't know if you're comfortable sharing how many. Oh like, God, roughly uh, how many acres you guys have up there? We have. <laughs> so we have, <clears throat> shit. I mean, the guys we run. I mean, we add every we add some every year. Yeah. So I mean, I. Uh, I can't give you an exact number. I can find out like really fast. I just don't know off the top of my head because each year um, as we acquire more properties, we add more hunters because, you know, our thing is we don't want to overpressure farms. And, you know, our philosophy is, you know, we try to stick to it, but it's like one, one hunter per hundred acres. And, um, you know, one thing we do is we are on a week, we're off a week, we're on a week, we're off a week, just so we just keep the pressure low on our farms. And it's like, you get other places where, you know, they lease or whatever, but they'll just throw three or four guys on oh, they know, hunt the one shit farm. Out and they bury Exactly. It. And, and that's what we don't do. And so as we keep acquiring farms, then we keep adding hunters. And, you know, like we have, we have a wait list of over 2,000. And I wish I was exaggerating, but it's like, that's how many, that's how big our wait list is because of the success we've had. And, um, I don't know the exact number, but we have several thousand acres in Wisconsin. We have 22 farms there. And then we have 
uh 45 leased farms in kansas because we're expanding out there now oh wow okay awesome yeah, yeah. So, so huge operation a lot of hunters yeah lot, yeah lot of land. yeah it's yeah it's a lot yeah it's it's a full-time thing and then even with the production standpoint i mean we got i think it's like 14 or 15 episodes we got to you know produce and it's a lot <laughs> And so they're they're intertwined, right? Like you guys are filming hunts on, like on these properties. That's a part of like promoting yeah, yeah, the outfit yeah. So, as well. Yeah, yeah, as... yeah. So it's it's easy because it's well, I wouldn't say easy, but it's like we have hunters that come in, um, and we'll film them. We'll film their hunts to produce like the episodes and stuff like that. But this year, uh, we actually have an off year. Just again, it was strategic because it's like we've over the past couple of years we've had a very very high success rate of killing. Like I think every every camp has been over 50 percent um some 75 plus percent which is unheard of yeah um you know and that just speaks volumes to what we're doing and you know my business partner jokes he's like yeah like you know other outfitters might have bigger deer but you know we know how to kill we know how to kill deer yeah you know and, and that's great but it's like damn like we're having too much success it's like yeah. You know, you're some outfits are lucky to get 50%, and that's even high. And it's like we're coming in, you know, like I said, 75% plus, and we're like, fuck. Well, success so like, is it's a good thing for the clients. Yeah. Success is like, different damn, for everybody, like, you know? Like some guys might yeah. be more than happy to come in and shoot, like, shoot a two year old buck. And like, that's, I, I was successful. I went up there and well, I did. Yeah, it. yeah. That's, that is successful. And, you know, we try to shy away from that because, like, we want the deer to grow, get mature, and, do you guys have like genetics. do you have like minimums in place? Like I'm sure it's different in Wisconsin from Kansas. We have but... a hit list. Well, we have a hit list at the outfit. So it's like when guys come in, we'll be like, hey, like this is the farm you're going on. Like these are your five target bucks we want you to go after. How good are these guys are identifying those? <laughs> that, that's my said, question. What? I said, how good are those guys identifying those bucks? Well, that's the thing. We're not putting beginners there. Like, okay. We're putting guys there that are experienced, know what they're doing, and then more times than not. We'll have, you know, a camera guy with them that knows the area, knows okay. the farm, knows the deer. So this is completely different than like the normal outfit, man, which is like no, yeah, yeah, yeah. random well, we, dude we from Florida. World class, yeah, so. random dude from Florida comes up, you throw him in a tree stand, he basically shoots whatever the hell he wants, right? You, no, you, and yeah, usually no, they say it's we it's we like 130 know. and up, right? Yeah. Very rarely, in my experience, is it like, hey, here's specific deer that we're going after. I mean, yeah. may, maybe there's like, hey, but if you, you know, something Very else. Few. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've had guys that came in and shot, you know, 130s, 140s, but, you know, we were okay with that because that was, like, their biggest gear they've ever yeah, seen. which is cool. So it's like, you know, for us, at the end of the day, it's about the client's experience. Yeah. And, you know, we want them to be happy, but we're also not going to put them on. No, that's not true either. But to that point, you know, the more experienced guys that we know and, you know, trust, like, we've had guys past, you know, 150s, 160s. Mm -hmm. You know, because they know the caliber of deer that are on our farms and, you know, they're after, you know, that booter buck. And um, we've actually had several episodes where a guy, you know, he didn't he didn't harvest a deer because, you know, he was after that 175 plus that were out there. But, you know, he passed on, you know, lifetime deers for a lot of people. But, you know, he was just after, you know, a certain kind of deer. It is funny, man, that perspective of like the I just remember, you know, the first time you saw a 130 inch buck. I. I've shot him, I, yeah. you know, and I remember at the time I was mm -hmm. like, that is the biggest deer in the Giant. world, yeah. like that, I, you know, for sure, yeah. for sure that I'd ever seen, you know, and it's funny to like, look at it on my wall now. Cause it's, I got it bounded. It was the biggest deer I shot at the time. And I was like, well, it's all perspective. Yeah. I mean, we have, we, we have good friends in Iowa at, um, big buck down outfitter and we were actually just there turkey hunting. And I mean, they were finding 190 inch deadheads. Like, oh, yeah, this is normal. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's like well, fuck. Yeah, yeah, like, dude, that's it, a job. It's just you know, it just depends uh, on where you're at, and you know, we had. Well, you're we had in Kansas too, so you'll start back. to find them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And like we have big deer too, uh, just not all over the place like that. But it's also you know different locations, genetics, stuff like that. But I remember one year we had a guy had a 200 inch deer at 15 yards at bow range, and he just froze. Mm. He, he couldn't pull <laughs> pull his bowstring back and. Oh, yeah, no. it, was, it was it was a rough camp for him, but oh. um, you know it's just you know it's just people really don't understand buck fever till you're really in that situation. So. Dude, so how would you like? How would you define uh, that Southwest with like we've never hunted Wisconsin? Like yeah. you, you've hunted for sure Kansas, right? Have you hunted Iowa, some other Midwestern no. states? No, no, I've, no. Um, 
like I said, I just retired, so I didn't have the luxury of being able to hunt in all these different places and stuff like that just because of time. But um, I got a bow hunt in Iowa coming up this year. Uh, I think I'm going to make my way down to Kansas, too. But, I mean, I got, you know, elk hunts in Nevada, New Mexico. I'm I'm busy, man. You're living it now, <laughs> man. Yeah. Yeah, now you're living busy, it, man. Yeah. I guess yeah, what I'm what I guess my question is like you know the quality of like is isn't it like the most? Uh, I mean, Buffalo County is like the most you know famed county in all of whitetail deer hunting. I mean, it it just yeah, it's, it it if has you're a whitetail been, hunter like you know yeah of Buffalo County, which is so. why it's been such a hot topic lately with the whole CWD thing in that area, right? I mean, because this is the ultimate mecca for whitetail deer. You know, and now, like much of Wisconsin, you know, CWD's been discovered or, you know, found close or whatever they want to call it. Mm. Um, mm. And so it's like, you know, what, because it's so highly sought after, it's like, well, what are the regulations now, if they change them, going to do to that area? You know, and I don't know if they've figured it out. I haven't put my, you know, put my ear to the ground on that stuff yet, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the soils. I mean, you're along the Mississippi river, right? I mean, it's the bluffs of the Mississippi. Um, you know, it's, it's just the history of that area and probably the farm size in that area. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that have been going for that area of, of Wisconsin that, you know, it's why if you look at a Boone and Crockett map, that area of Wisconsin is the mm -hmm. brightest, darkest red, mm -hmm. you know, just has been. So... But I think with that, and Trey's probably seeing it now, you know, it comes with a price, right? I mean, that because oh, yeah. it's it, the way that recreational it, land yeah. is, has grown. It's, and it's hard. It's hard now to like, cause when we first started, like, like I said, we bought our first farm at 3,500 an acre, yep. which is a steal. And now it's like, I mean, you can get it. Like people are selling bare. Like, again, I'd say this humbly, but it's like, <clears throat> people are just selling average farms now for anywhere from you know eight to upwards of ten thousand an acre That's and they're crazy. not even near the quality of like what we're doing but guess what the surrounding farms are you know really good or something mm -hmm. like that or the area's just been discovered and it's like you're not going to find a property for 3,500 an acre anymore. Well, dude, when, like you sell, not. when you sell real estate you know it's all about comps you know very few people are yeah. looking as you know close or know as much about like the elements of value on a piece of property they're like well this one down here you know, it's right down the road there just sold for 11 you know yours should go for you know at least eight, you know exactly yeah exactly. and that's all it's that like goes into a, it. it's like you go in a subdivision or something and you like the average house is let's say three hundred thousand. you know that's the worth and then i come in and i tear down that house and build a million dollar house right yep. next to it well the value of that house is just going to go up yep, immediately and it's just going to keep going yeah so it's you know it it's 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 good but, you know, like I said, when we had the wait list of over 2,000 and, you know, the price increase, I mean, those are just champagne problems. Yeah. But still problems. Dude, yeah. <laughs> you know, the problem, too, is, like, the, the realtors don't know half the time and the buyers don't know either. Like, no. they don't know what they're buying. They're just like, they, they, they both just think it's like, yeah, it's in the area. Like, that's the right thing. And, yeah, you know, maybe you can, you can turn it into, you know, you can improve the well, quality. Not, so, to that point, not to cut you off, but that's why we partnered with who we did with Wise Realty because they are – they're, they're a local real estate business and, you know, the guys we work with really close are from that area. So they know the area nice. and they know how to, you know, market and sell it. And they know, then they hunt themselves, you know, they own yeah. land themselves. So it's like, they're not just, you know, cause we, we had, we used to work with some guys, um, you know, in the, in the financial, you know, aspect world of it. And, you know, when we were like, oh yeah, you know, this is what we're doing. They had no idea of, no idea. of the value of the land. No. And it's like, you know what? we're just going to work with somebody else from the area that actually knows what they're talking about. Cause it's like you said, a random guy can just come in. They just see a chunk of land. It's like, Oh, you know, that looks so they have no fucking clue. Yeah. No. They have no idea how much it's really worth. And you know, the value, you know, and the long-term play it comes with. We see that even on the local bank side. It's like there's local banks who are in that area. I could walk into Buffalo County and tell you how much this land should go for better than they could. They just don't have any yeah. idea. They're like, okay, well, it's got not just banks, but they're appraisers. Yeah, the people whose job it it's is got to know how much acres stuff is of tillable. It's got forty acres of woods. It's got thirty acres of brush. I don't know. I mean, it's not the best tillable. Mm -hmm. and it's like, dude, are you kidding me? This is a killer buck property. And it's mm -hmm. funny. It's not just. It's not just. Uh, and that's something we talk about. All we actually. Uh, had a conversation about that today um when it because we were talking you know financial stuff and like um 
we were even just talking about loans. They're like, dude, like, yeah, but if you don't get the right person, it could take months. It could take up to six months, and they don't really know the value behind it. So they're going to have no idea. Appraise yeah. it probably under value. And it's like, it's just Constant. the headaches that go. It, it's just a headache because it's like, you know, and it, I don't know if it's just ignorance or they're just. It's a strategic lack play of to undervalue it. Yeah. It's a lack of experience. Lack of experience. And understanding. You know. They also don't want to take any risk, which you can't blame them, right? The, the higher they appraise it for, the more they're at risk. Yeah, but if, with if, you, if you do your homework on it, you'll know it's not a risk. Well, the risk is them not understanding the property. That's exactly Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Dude, I'm curious, since you didn't like grow up in a hunting lifestyle necessarily, like it have you experienced kind of the different <laughs> levels of like intimate knowledge <laughs> oh of, my God. of hunting and hunting you have no properties? Idea. And I'm still not even, I don't even consider myself that knowledgeable, but because like I said, like I just retired. So it's like everything I was involved with was always, you know, on the back end or behind the scenes or, um, you know, I'm catching, you know, while I'm, you know, in between (laughs) meetings or going to practice or after games. And it's like, I'm trying to, you know, keep up with every, because, you know, my wife and my business partner, they really handle all the day to days while I was playing because i was you know i would leave for work at 6 30 i wouldn't get home till 5 30 yeah and i'd mm-hmm. get home i'd have to you know i'd maybe get an hour to myself i'd hang out with the wife and kids and i'd study for you know however long and then i'd go to sleep do it all over again so i maybe had hour and a half two hours to myself oh. after i got home from work before yeah. i had to work you got some more catching up to do brother. so it's like <laughs> yeah so it's like i'm <laughs> So I'm really, I'm trying to keep up and, you know, retain a lot of, you know, the knowledge and information I'm getting from, you know, just this business since I've, you know, started. And now that I'm retired, I'm trying to get, you know, a lot more involved and, you know, just like you said, catch up and learn. So well, don't be I wouldn't o- consider myself an expert or very knowledgeable at all, but I'm, I'm coming along. It doesn't matter at all. I mean, don't be, don't be overwhelmed by that. I mean, certain, certainly the new business aspect of it is like, yeah, there's a lot to catch up on, but from yeah. a, a hunting and outdoorsman standpoint, it's like there, there is no, no point that you have to get to, you know, it's, it's kind of the journey. Yeah. Just it's be the a journey. Store. Yeah. Yeah. But as a business owner, like you should really know your business. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, so yeah. like, that's just, you know, because you don't want to own something and have no, you know, understanding or idea of what's going on. Because, you know, that's how For guys sure. get taken advantage of. That's how they miss on opportunities. Exactly. And it's just, I mean, there's just more to gain by being more involved and knowledgeable. Yeah, no so. doubt. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Dude, where would we be without our Hoyt bows? Probably shooting crossbows. <laughs> or, or a Matthews. Yeah. <laughs> One in the same. Yeah. But in all seriousness, we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out. When you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows, I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Uh, dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th- th- especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I-, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for, for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with the RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a C4 of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr- proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. Did you, so, you know, you were talking about in between like meetings and stuff. Was there anybody else on the teams that kind of shared the passion for hunting and outdoors that you were like, hey, man, like I wish we were out hunting right yeah. now? <laughs> yeah, actually, one of my buddies, um, I don't know if he's still playing or not, but last time I checked, he was on the Bears, but uh, Riley Reef. Yeah. Uh, we were actually, um, you know, he got dra- drafted to Detroit and then he ended up in Minnesota for a couple years and we were actually locker mates and. You know, he was a big hunter too and like me and him we would sit you know in our lockers just sharing like trail cam pictures of you know Dude, deer we got hilarious. on our properties and yeah so i mean was, that was always cool and um you know there was other guys that were interested but you know he was by far you know the one i related to the most in that in that area so i think you like you said before the and it's not that there aren't people who played football and stuff that love hunting and, you know, just you don't hear about it. It's just it consumes so much time in, like, the peak hunting season that it was almost oh, impossible yeah. to do it. Like, it was almost impossible to No, yeah, it really hunt. is. And yeah. Because I know he would go on our bye week if it timed up. Um, but like I said, like, luckily, 
you know, Minnesota is only about an hour and a half drive from yep. where our properties were. So, you know, I would, you know, go up for a couple hours, sit, and then drive right back. So uh, it, it's definitely it's definitely hard to be in that, you know, field and to be really involved while still playing, you know, football since it's both in the fall. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of commonalities between like we were talking about the, the demographics of like hunters and of people who, who play professional sports. It's just like, it's an intense level of focus that it takes like to compete at the level that you competed at. And also, you know, to, to hunt at the level that some guys are hunting at. You know, and it's almost like yeah. cause Jeremy and oh, I say yeah. all the time, it's like, dude, we, we couldn't, I couldn't fathom doing anything else. Like when the, when the season comes, granted it's shorter than a professional football season, but it's like, dude, that's, that's all we do. Like, you, think know, about. Yeah. Yeah. you know, it's like everything else fades away. And, and you your just, window of opportunity is pretty small too. That's yeah. it, man. And you just focus. Yeah. And I, dude, I have to believe that the, uh, the amount of people like who play professional sports that are, are hunters or have interest in, in hunting, uh, is much greater than that of the general public. Yeah. You know, and it's because of that, like, extreme focus mentality. Like, I have to be the best that I can be at this. Yeah. Yeah, and there's – I've run into a couple guys. Like, um, you know, I got some buddies that I've played with or I grew up with that, you know, one of my good friends, he actually coaches at Michigan State now. Like, we played there together. But, I mean, he's, he's, he's talking to me about some players that they have that are, you know, really into hunting as well. And then one of my best friends, uh, he's an agent. You know, he talked to me a couple months ago about – potentially doing an nil deal situation with one of his guys because you know they're yeah. really big in the hunting that's so what like, dude that's exactly a, what i was gonna just well dude for, for yeah. first world experience we've got a piece of property coming up for sale like probably next week that's on the adjacent hillside to 145 acres that roethlisberger has for sale yeah oh there you go yeah right here in town yeah I was going to ask you, Trey, about the nil side not to dive into the weeds of like thoughts necessarily on the college aspect but you know, it seems like on the hunting industry side, there would be a major attraction, you know, from from that angle on the NIL. But it just seems like it's it's such a, you know, far apart space and world right now. It is. Um, and I can only speak from our perspective. Um, it's just it's different than, you know, some of these other businesses. And, you know, I've it's something we're still working on. But it it doesn't seem like, you know, possibility from our end just because, you know, when I was talking to my buddy who's the agent, it's like, yeah, like we could easily, you know, throw him some money or we could, you know, figure out stuff with sponsors and whatever. But it's like, what value do we get out of it? You know, it's not mm -hmm. like we're a startup outfit. Like we already have, you know, one of the more popular hunting TV shows out. We have a wait list of over 2,000. Right. Like what? What is uh, like, where is the value for us? You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like, we're already booked out. We already have a very successful show. Like, unless he can miraculously give us more land, like there's nothing that, there's not a return for us. Sure. And, um, you know, like I said, we're, we're not trying to sell more hunts. Yeah. So we don't need to, but it's like, <clears throat> just so, I mean, for that, you know, there wasn't, you know, a return in it for us, which is why we've struggled so hard on trying to figure out which angle to go to. Mm -hmm. But like I said, like maybe other outfits that, you know, aren't as, you know, busy or successful, that's something they could explore. I mean, because like I said, we're, we're outfit, you know, it's not like yeah. we're really selling clothes or anything like that or trying to bring well, that's what shoes. I guess I was going to say like so, on, on the menu what do you think about on a manufacturing side like for like say one of your sponsors to do an NIL deal with someone does that seem to make sense well and you know like I said it, it could but we're you know it's hard because will that said player give them more traction sure than what we're already given yeah because I mean all of our sponsors, they're writing us pretty hefty checks. Well, I mean, but their deliverables are also very, very high too. And it's like, well, yeah, you need a very, very high profile player to even bring that kind of attention. Because if you get, I don't know, let's say a fourth round draft pick that, yeah, you know, may or may not play and maybe has like, let's say, ten thousand followers, like, is that really going to help promote your brand and sell stuff? No. Well, so yeah. it's like you got to find the right guy, and like I like more times than not, some of those guys aren't really not saying they're not, but 
their main focus isn't necessarily in the hunting. It's, you know, let's win Super Bowls or let's win championships, yeah. stuff like that. Because it's really hard to play at that level and have other interests that mm. take away focus from what you're doing. Because, you know, so it's, it's a killer be killed business. And, you know, that's not coming from me. That's coming from other players. Like every day somebody is trying to take your spot, trying to take food off the table for you and your family. And they're grown ass men. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, you know, little middle school. It's like, no, like you're competing with the best of the best trying to take your spot, trying to, you know, basically, you know, your job. And it's yeah. like you focus elsewhere, then that could be your career. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that, I think that makes sense. I think it's, you know, one of those things we talked about even at the the pro level, but now, you know, think of some of the NIL money coming into the college side of things. You know, it's like, who's advising these 18, 19 year old kids to do smart things with that money? Do you see me over here Googling NIL? Yeah, it's, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little risky. And I mean, you got kids making hundreds of thousands of worth of millions. And, you know, I. Kids who haven't even played a snap them. yet for some of them. Yeah. Yeah. And good for them. <laughs> because I mean, that that's a lot of money, but. You know, I tell I tell people all the time. I was like, "Thank God I didn't have that shit." Because I mean, I mean, I I don't know how I would have been. And like, my thing is like, now with these NIL deals and how they're set up, not all of them, but a lot of them, it's like now you have these athletes, you know, trying hard to promote their brand rather than yeah, you know, it's their their game skill level on the football field. Yeah, so it's like you're worried about doing TikToks for this person or making these posts and doing all this other shit. It's like, well, I'm at the practice facility putting in extra work because yeah, like this is what I, this, cause I went back to Michigan state and I talked to some of those guys and I was like, yeah, you know, 70,000 school, a hundred thousand school, but it's not 20 million. Right. You know, what would you rather have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's cool now, but it's like, you know, the, the big, the big payday, the, generational wealth is the next level not here in fucking college yeah it's just hard Unless, for a lot I mean, of you're an exception because some guys are making like what eight fucking million now yeah. but those are what like three guys three guys exactly level, so but it's just hard for some of these guys who probably you know grew up poor or urban areas or whatever they come out no i get somebody it. throws a yeah. hundred grand at them they're like holy shit like this is amazing but yeah. to your point you're right it's not and if it is there's not a doubt in my mind that it's taking away from time that should be spent at honing their skills and being better on the field because they have deliverables to hit. I'm not just going to give them a hundred grand and say, cool, like wear me oh. on a shirt. Right. Like you're going to have to I do mean, stuff. Then that's just added pressure too. And it's like, luckily, like that's something that once you get to the collegiate level in NFL, like you learn to deal with it, but it's not an easy thing to do. Cause like once, you know, this NIL deal is like 500 grand. Well, now you better fucking perform yeah you know that's just more more added stress and you know stuff going on in your head on top of what you already have to do yeah so it's like it could be a good thing it could be a bad thing um you know I, i'm glad they're getting paid i just you know i just hope it doesn't take away from the ultimate end goal on what these you know kids are trying to achieve yeah no i think now it's like oh shit i gotta ball out for this nil deal i was like well that's not why you went to college but yeah you, know, you went to college to well, get an education, try to make it to the next level, not get this next make money, right? You know, yeah. Ultimately. Not get this next NIL deal. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think it's I think it'll be interesting to see how it continues to play out. And even, you know, from a, a money management side, because, you know, you just don't want some of these kids to make bad decisions at eighteen and nineteen. Right. Yeah, and you're surrounded, you're on a college campus surrounded by a bunch of college kids i don't know what the hell to do with their money anyways and it's like my thing was like i was more so for the players getting paid for you know being on like the ncaa games and stuff like yeah. that because i mean that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that makes fine. sense but like once you start throwing hundreds of thousands of dollars in directions that's like holy shit that opens up another can of worms because it's like even when i got drafted like what just, like just just an example like when i was at the combine you know i did this thing with adidas where you know, the top three fastest guys won a hundred grand. Mm -hmm. And it's what like, was your four? You know, I was one, uh, officially four, three, one, unofficially like four, two, nine or something. That's fast. Boy, but yeah, no, is. to that point though, it's like, after I did that, like I, it went across like 
you know, the ticker on sports and whatever. And I can't tell you the number of people that texted me like screenshots of that or is like, is that you? Like, did you do that? Like, did you really get that? Not, Hey, how did the combine go? It's like, did you win that hundred grand? Yeah. It's like, fuck dude. Like immediately the whole combine. And that's what you, that's what you want to ask about. Like you can ask about that later. But even when I got drafted, I had people hitting me up. Hey, we're related. I'm like, no, I'm fucking not. You're shitting. Like, me. I know, I know. Just my coming family, out of the like, woodworks, like out of the woodworks. Like, hey, like you know, we're related. I think we're cousins. <laughs> like, bro, like I know my family. No, we're not. <laughs> like, Holy you know, it's just, you'd be shit. you'd be surprised on you know people that come out just trying to ask for handouts and just now get involved now that you have a little bit of success and money and it's. No, it's it's a scary thing, and now you got college kids that have to deal with it. Well, yeah, and I did. So. I frankly just think most of them can't. They, they they can't. It's peer pressure. You know, it's you know, hey, they want to. You know, they want people to like them or whatever. You know, it's just common mm-hmm. common thought process, and so I think it's just a lot of weight hanging on them, and you know. You try to think about is. dealing with a, like a hundred thousand dollars in in college. Like, dude, I had to call my dad and ask for like gas money. I know. <laughs> I remember when oh I, my god! I remember when that I bounced. That shit was tough. I bounced yeah. in college, dude. I, 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 I was like saltine crackers and ketchup, oh, dude. dude. I bounced my what? bank account for a can of snuff one time. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Probably hamburger helper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. I the hamburger hu- helper stuck with yeah. me well into my twenties. Oh, see, yeah. that was the good part of of deer hunting in college, man. I had a freezer full of venison, and that's what we ate. Like yeah. that's all we had, man. Other than that, it was it was slim pickings around there. Uh. But yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a whole different game in terms of it. Well, and you see the transfer portals and things like that starting to happen and kids. Yeah, that's just wild. Too. Yeah, it's just, it, it, it just has changed it a lot. Um, you know, and I, again, I feel for some of those kids and, you know, especially, you know, how, how few of them like are going to make it. Soft. Yeah. Well, how few of them are like, going to make it to the next level <laughs> too. It's just, well, this is how I look at it. It's like, you know, I didn't fucking walk into high school a superstar i didn't walk into college a fucking superstar i had to you know wait my turn bust my ass and when i got my chance i took advantage of it not oh i'm not a day one starter let me transfer and that's what you see all the time now it's like bro like come on like you're not gonna get better doing that like they kicked our ass in college but it you know it hardened us it made us better it showed us work ethic Mm -hmm. you know it's like like i said just because shit got hard doesn't mean we just ran away to a different school or a different situation like we gutted it out and like i know there's some situations where you know that's the only option for you know guys to play or whatever but like i said i didn't fucking walk in michigan state as a starter i didn't even think i'd be able to play at that level yeah. because of how crazy it was but you know with with the guys i had ahead of me and you know <clears throat> them me able to learn from them and them kind of mentoring me and kicking me in my ass like that's you know what made me good and then like I tell a lot of people, like, a lot of success I had at Michigan State was, you know, attested to um, <clears throat> one of my good friends, Darquez Denard. And he was, you know, he was older than me, and we played the same position. But, you know, I was a fucking screw-off in college. Like, I was fucking off a lot. And I remember one day in the locker room, he got in my ass. He was like, bro, like, cut the shit. Like, you need to quit fucking bullshit and, like, you have the ability, you have the talent, like, you know, get it together. And, you know, from then on, like me and him, like we, we fucking, we went to work, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, just cause shit was hard. Doesn't mean I, Oh, I'm transferring to a smaller school so I can play. It's like, no, like it took that grit. Those guys that went through the process, that hard process to show me the way, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, I think a lot of people crumble under that kind of confrontation, they do. you know, they, they will move. They will go to the next one. Especially just... They will take another job. In today's society, it's the comfort... People want to be comfortable. We talk about this all the time. It's like, no, dude, the only way you're going to get better is to be uncomfortable, to to feel like oh, you're that's struggling, what we preach. Well, that's what they say in football. They're like, their main thing was, we're going to get you comfortable with being uncomfortable. There like, you go. You got to be comfortable That's it. That's life, dude. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and it's hard, but it's like another thing that they really preached in college was accountability. Yes. You know, it's not, and you know, they really preach that, which is another big thing that, you know, I hold near and dear to my heart, like be fucking accountable with your actions and what you do. And, you know, it, it's hard, but you know, that will get you a lot further in life and a lot of aspects too. Yeah. No doubt. 
That's crazy, man. I, I, I think it, you know, when you talk about all that stuff and obviously you now coming out and having, you know, essentially probably the most time you've had in a decade plus of your life. Like, oh I, you know, I almost feel like you probably have a little bit of stir craziness of like, you're just so used to having a regiment schedule that it's like, all right, like I have to do, like, I got to keep myself busy in this other stuff. Oh yeah. And like, I always said, I was like, when I retire, I'm going to get fat. Like, I'm going to do all this shit. But it's like, <laughs> like I said before, like, I'm, I feel like I'm just as busy, if not more busy, like, with this stuff. And, but it, it's cool because I actually enjoy it. And, mm -hmm. like, we got this ranch out here that I'm, you know, working on every fucking day. We got horses and, you know, all this stuff. So it's like, I'm still busy. And it's like, I can't, like, everybody's like, oh, I can't wait to retire and just sit. And I'm like, mm, it's kind of yeah. boring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's what? not, it's not really all it's hyped up to be. And it's like, you know, you can only sit around for not, so long. Yeah. It's, it's kind of boring. And it's like when you're doing stuff that you enjoy, it's, it's just different, you know? So well, that's rather than say. just sitting around being lazy and, you know, doing a job you hate, like doing something you actually enjoy. It sounds cliche as shit, but it's like when you really enjoy what you do, you're not really working, whatever, whatever. But I mean, yeah. there's some merit to it. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's exactly that's that's what I was gonna say. I was wondering if how many guys are you know probably question like, dude, like you're you're done. Like, what are you gonna do? And now, yeah. kind of as they've seen you start like to do this other stuff and enjoy what you're doing, that I don't know, maybe a little bit of jealousy or envy <coughs> of it, you know, to a point. Well, <coughs> so like <coughs> my last two years in Cincy, like I fucking plagued with injuries, but like I was still kind of you know in my prime like i walked away and i like i could still easily play another three four years and like a lot of my friends like dude like why are you walking away so early like you're leaving a lot of money on the table or you know this this and that like you could still play and like i i could easily like when i walked away like i had teams calling like i almost actually went to philly um, no, but, don't go like, to I had multiple we don't, teams. We don't need well, to I go didn't. to Philly. I didn't. But you could have came to I Pittsburgh, teams. just not Philly. <laughs> but, but like to that point, I had a lot. I had options. Like I could still play. Yeah. But it was like for one, I didn't fucking enjoy it, and two, it was like I understood the NFL business enough to where I was like, well, you know what? For what? Because it's like with my last two years of injury, no one's gonna, no one's gonna. I'm either gonna have to take a pay cut, or nobody's gonna wanna pay me when I want to be paid so now I'm going to be playing on a prove it deal making it's all perspective but bullshit money mm -hmm. you know when, when, when I say that's like you know a couple hundred grand but it's like I'm not doing that shit I'm not I'm not putting in the time the stress the strain on my body the long ass season the camp just to get that shit like hell no like you know I, I make more like because what I've done in investing in you know financial I was like dude I make way more than that outside of football so why the fuck would i go exactly. through all that bullshit again to make a fraction of what i'm making without even playing yeah so i was like you know it, it was kind of an easy decision and you know a lot of that had to do with for one the business and how successful that was and from the equity standpoint of that and then just how i invested it and so it, it was really a no-brainer because i mean if i was still making you know 10 plus mil it's like okay there's a difference but i mean i even told my wife i was like Somebody would have to offer me, a, it sounds fucked up, but it's like they'd have to offer me at least eight for me to consider it because mm -hmm. of how much I'm making off the field. It's yeah. like now you want me to go play and go through all this shit and fuck up my body even more for, you know, change, some change from what, you know, I know I should be making and wasn't making. I was like, hell no. Yeah. But I do have a lot of buddies that, you're like, damn, bro, like, I wish I could walk away. I wish I could retire. Like, I'm so over this shit, but I'm still playing because, you know, want to make a couple extra bucks. I wish I would have invested They sooner. just didn't put it in the right places. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, I mean, I get it. Because it's like, you know, my thing was like, I wanted to go on my own terms. I knew, or like, my rookie fucking year, I was like, dude, I'm not playing this shit till the wheels fall off. I don't want to keep playing for long. And I was like, that's why I started getting proactive. So I, you know, when I was like, I'm over this shit, fuck it. I had the ability to just walk away. And, you know, I remember after the Super Bowl in Cincinnati, like I got hurt then too. And I was like, 
after that game, I text my agent. I said, get me cut. I'm done. I texted my agent after the score. I said, I'm done. He said, I said, get me cut. He said, all right, cool. Let's do it. But he knew he was also comfortable with it because he knew, yeah. you know, could I keep playing? Yeah. Am I going to cost him some money? Yeah. But I mean, we, we had, you know, a relationship that was just more than just, Oh, you're my, you're my football player. Like he he knew, has yeah. so many other guys that are making the money, but he knew, you know, where I was mentally, yeah. where my body was. And he played in the league. So he's like, dude, like my body's fucked. Your body's already fucked. And if you keep playing, it's going to keep getting more messed up. So he's like, you know what? Cool. And, you know, we were getting calls. We were getting calls. He's like, what do you want to do? I said, fuck him. I'm on my time. Well, that's so, what like, I was going to say, season, dude. Yeah. You're yeah, your own like, boss. After the season, he's like, hey, like, you know, Patriots are calling. Like, these guys are calling. Indies, whatever. And he's like, what, what do you want me to tell him? And I'm like, nah, I'm walking in the woods right now. Mm-hmm. And literally, I was walking in the woods in Buffalo County doing stuff for our business. And, you know, it was funny because I was like, well, this is this is the two ways I'll come back. One way, if I go to Houston, because all the players cover two, and I don't have to run a lot, and I just get to play in the run front and hit people, which was the only reason I fucking signed up to play football, because I hate running. And then I was like, that's one reason, or one one stipulation. And then the other one is if I play with, you know, my best friend. Yeah. Sure enough, both those things happen. I'm like, fuck, you guys called my bluff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so still I was not like, coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like, damn. So I was like, you know what? You know, just I'll think on it, whatever, whatever. And I remember right before, because I didn't want to announce it, because I was like, I don't owe anybody shit. I don't yeah. owe the league shit. I don't have to, I don't want to do a whole announcement. Like, I'm just done. And that's how I was going to go about it. And then it ended up, you know, on one of my friend's podcast, he was like, Oh, dude, like, you know, why would you cut your hair? Because, like, I always said, when I'm done playing, I'm cutting cutting my, my dreads off. And he was like, and I told him, I was like, yeah. I was like, I always said when I was done, I was cutting him. He's like, oh, wait, what? And then it kind of just <laughs> yeah. took off from there. But I remember I was coming, I forgot where I was coming home from. But uh, one of my old coaches, he was actually the D.C. in Philly. Uh, he's now the head coach in Arizona, I think. But he was the D.C. at the time in Philly. And I was sitting in the airport and he had sent me a text and he was like, Hey, like, you know, how you feeling? Like you healthy, you ready to go? Like you want to come play here? I'm like, fuck dude. And like, I really, that's, this is a guy I like really respected. Yeah. You know, he was our safety coach in Minnesota. I had a relationship with him and I was like, fuck. And I texted one of my good friends. I'm like, bro, I, I sent him that message. He's like, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, if I tell him like no, like it's it's done. Yeah. So like I sat on that message for probably like four hours contemplating what I was gonna do, and then you know finally I was like you know what fuck it like I'm not I'm done. Wow. And I, I I texted him and he respected it, but I was like I I literally that was the closest I I've been to coming back because I almost, and you know you know there's other teams that have reached out and but like I almost went to Philly for a second, but I you know ultimately. <laughs> You know, I was comfortable enough with where I was at financially and where our business was and how, like how it was established that, you know, I, I could just walk away. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's what I did. So that's awesome, man. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I'm sure even though like you kind of sit on those things, it's not an easy decision because, you, you know, let's be honest, you poured most of your life into that sport. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that's what it's been. Yeah. And, and, you know, my thing was, you know, once you get to the professional level, like where I was at, like it was, it was easy money. I mean, it was a lot of money and you know, it was a lot of, it was enough money for, you know, to change a lot of people's lives and stuff like that. Um, But I never looked at football. Well, I mean, I I used to, you know, as a kid, but once, you know, the realization of injury, you know, became prevalent and that it was a real deal and, you know, with concussions, and I've seen guys, you know, get I, – I mean, I almost paralyzed myself twice playing. I had multiple concussions, but it's like, you know, once seeing all of the realities that a lot of people miss out on become real, um, you know, football became – instead of it becoming my life, it became of just a head start financially. And that's how mm-hmm. I looked at it. I was like, you know what? I don't care about being in the Hall of Fame. I don't care about, you know – Pro Bowls or all pros or all this shit. Like, 
it's a head start financially for me and my family for, you know, now and life after football. So that that's how I saw it. So I was like, why the why would I keep killing myself for people's entertainment that really don't give a fuck about me instead of just, you know, being smart with my money, making as much as I can and getting out like I can still walk. Good for you, you man. I mean, I I think, like I said, I just, you see so many of these guys playing later and later in their careers and injury riddled and, you know, they just, for whatever reason, they just can't get out of it, you know? And, and Mm -hmm. I don't think that once they do get out of it, you know, the quality of what they're doing is probably not nearly as good as what you've got laid out in front of you here, you know, as a Well, I think a lot of it, not to cut you off, is they don't have outlets. Like, yeah, yeah, we have other hobbies and interests, but it's like, you know, you see a lot of guys when they leave the game, well, if they, like I always say, when I'm done, I'm getting as far as fucking possible. Like, I want nothing to do with it. And you know where I'm living now. (laughs) Far away from it. Yeah. Um, but it's like you, you see a lot of guys, like when they leave the game, they get into coaching or they get into, yep. you know, commentating about football. I'm like, dude, that's all we've known, you know, 24 fucking seven for how many years of our lives. And yep. it's like now you want to keep doing it. And it's like a lot of the, a lot of players, coaches, people are still involved. It's like there's a lot of time that's put into it, a lot of hours. And it's like, dude, like you really, really, really have to love the game. To especially be a coach after because they put even more hours than some of the players do yeah and it's like you either really love football or you just don't want to be around your family mm-hmm. it's like those guys don't go home and when they do go home they're still doing more football and it's like <clears throat> you know i always i always said like i just can't wait to be a normal person in person again because you know i i came to the realization that there's a life outside of football and there's more ways to make money and become wealthy without playing a fucking sport and banging your head against other people the hunter podcast is brought to you by stealth cam dude where would we be without our cell cams i would definitely be divorced at this point <laughs> yeah i hear that i mean the fact is is i spent more time checking cameras than i actually did hunting prior to cell cameras now at least my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home buried in my phone checking those pictures 100 yeah, percent. and dude when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras. Reliability is, I think, the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras, and ultimately that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. StealthCam.com. Check them out. What kind of injuries were you playing with like in the last two years and, and do any of those like kind of persist now? Oh my God. Well, I've, I've already accepted that my body's going to hurt the rest of its fucking life. But, um, my first year in since pack off the bone. So that was fun. Missed that whole season. Then came back, tore my hamstring really bad twice. My last, my last year in Cincinnati, and then I messed up my deltoid ligament in my foot in the Super Bowl or whatever. But, I mean, it's just, it's frustrating because it's like, you know, I mean, every playing with an injury anyways, but it's like, um, you know, I tore my hamstring the first time, you know, came back probably before I was ready, but I was trying to, you know, push through it, tore it even worse, which, you know, you know, probably wasn't a smart decision, but it's like, even <laughs> before that, it's like, well, you know, when I was in Minnesota, I had like seven concussions or something. Jesus, and then I, you know, dude. AC sprains and just shit like that. But it's like, dude, like that shit, it, it, it affects you and it lasts. Cause like, I remember like when it really became real, I was like, I had a routine. Like I would always, every Tuesday I would, I think it was Tuesday. Yeah. Every Tuesday I would go, go into film. I would go into the facility with Terrence Newman and, me and he was kind of like, you know, one of my mentors in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And me and him would always watch film and, you know, maybe work out or whatever. We'd always go in every Tuesday morning. And then from there, I would go to my daughter's dance class. And it was the same place, the same time, every Tuesday. And that Sunday, I had got a really good concussion. And I had left the facility. And I was driving to my daughter's class. And, you know, I ended up in a Target parking lot. And, you know, my wife's like, where the hell are you? I'm like, uh, can you text me the directions? She was like, you know where it's at. I was like, I can't remember how to get there. 
Like I'm, uh, I really, I, you got to tell me how to get there. I can't remember. And it's like, I've been there a hundred fucking times, yeah. but it's like, that's when it came. It became like really real. So I'm like, holy shit, dude. Like I can't even remember how to get to a place I've been a hundred times. Yeah. And I can't remember conversations I had five minutes ago. And it's like, now I got to stop thinking about myself and start thinking about, you know, my family and other people that are involved because if it was just me, like, it doesn't matter how fucked up I get. Like, if I was single, I'd still probably be playing. Mm -hmm. But I just have to worry about myself. Now I got other people I got to worry about and be responsible for. So it's like, you know, at what point is me putting my health on the line enough? Yeah. You know? Is that like on ongoing? I know like the CTE thing is like, you know, we hear a lot about it. And there's a guy in the hunting industry, Jason Harrison, that killed himself yep. uh, that they think, I believe, as a result of CTE. And he played football for a lot of years. Are, is there th mm -hmm. are there things that they do like after the fact now that are like, you know, hey, just like continued maintenance of those things or like ways that you can, uh, I don't know. No. I what, mean, are, what are you doing? You know, they say, what am I doing? I'm yeah. just. Horse and Hunt, hunting therapy. therapy. Yeah. Horse and hunting therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Horse and hunting uh, therapy. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. That's crazy, man. I mean, but again, it's so, I, uh, you know, you mentioned some of those guys. I assume you mentioned Melvin before. Is that Melvin Gordon? Mm hmm. Yeah. So you, you see some of these guys who have played in the league for a long time and, and, you know, you obviously know how much your body went through and you, these guys are getting still crushed out there. And it's oh like, my God. man, like it, you know, at some point, and I've, I, seen, I've seen some shit. Some guys are like really fucked. And like, are you guys familiar with Tordal at all? No. Tordal? Yeah. Oh, no. Why? You it's, are? It's like what is a, it? it's like a, it's like a, it's like a ibuprofen on like fucking a thousand. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. But I know I know guys that will take two of them just to get through games. And it's like I've seen guys finish games and leave the facilities and crutches and boots and like just the shit like we play through and put our bodies through is it's it's ridiculous. But again, it's like we don't really complain about it. We don't say much about it because for one, people don't care, and two, we have a job to do. Sure. And three, it's like well, if we don't, we got to be out there. Otherwise, we're gonna lose our job. So it's like guys put their bodies on the line like it's it's insane and it's like you know i i feel for those guys because i've you know, I've been there and it's like you know it's funny because they'll be like oh you know did you leave the game healthy or are you healthy this year i was like dude i haven't been healthy since fucking high school yeah because it's just something that that people don't want to hear about or care about and it's like they teach us at a young age like you know if you get knocked out or get up you're fine it's not oh are you okay it's get up you're fine so it's like that's what we tell ourselves um and you know that it's just it's it just becomes reality i remember in a preseason game i was uh yeah i was against buffalo it was just fucking preseason so it didn't mean shit but the starters they usually play like the first series or two it was like the first play of the game you know it was like a i don't know if it was a run or a pass or something no i think it was a pass it was like a little hitch or something but I ended up making the tackle and we had a linebacker coming over top. So I made the tackle and then the linebacker ended up missing the receiver as he was falling and ended up hitting me and driving my shoulder like into the ground. And I ended up having like a grade two uh, CT or uh, shoulder. I think it was like a CT sprain or something like that, whatever. It was the first fucking play. <laughs> I'm like, Dude, this shit, I thought I broke my shit. And um, I remember Harry's like, Trey, like, you got to get up. Not the first play. So I'm like, fuck. So I'm like, all right. So I got up. <laughs> Very next play, they run a dive to my side. Ended up making the tackle. I'm like, I'm fucked. I, so I just walked off the field. But it was just like, that happens more times than not. Like, when yeah. you get your bell rung, like, guys just get up and keep playing. And they could be concussed. But, you know, I know guys that cheat the system, too, with sure. concussions. Because... They need to be out there still. And, you know, it's like, yeah, we have team doctors. We have all these people. But, I mean, they're getting paid, too, by people with a yeah. lot more money. Than us. Oh, yeah. Dude, that's that's yeah. got to be one yeah. of the toughest, like, mental aspects of the game. Because, like, you're supposed to be, like, a peak performance athlete. Like, at a, at a pre, like you know, mm -hmm. and you think about just even when you get a cold or something, like, something, like, how out of it you feel. Like, I'm done. Like, I need to sit this one I mean, out. Like, it, we have to be on all the time. Yeah. And, you know, like I said before, nobody cares about what you're going through or, you know, mentally or how injured you are. Like, you're expected to perform. So it's like a lot of the guys that 
professional level, it's like nobody knows a lot of the shit they go through because nobody, I mean, we don't tell anybody either. And it's like, mm-hmm. it used to drive my wife crazy. Like if ever I got in the mood or whatever, she's like, hey, you okay? Or like, whatever, you good? And I mean, even guys, you know, amongst ourselves, like, yo, like, you good? It's like, I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah. Keep it going. You know, that's just, you know, what we were kind of trained to be, like, just suppress a lot of emotions and pain and just, you know, keep going. But I mean, that's also what we signed up for. Like, I'm not bashing anything. Nobody held a gun to my head and said, you got to go play this, you know, sport. Like, it's something I did and wanted to do. So, you know, that's the reason why we don't complain either and just accept some of the, you know, consequences we got to live with is because this is what we chose to do. It's, you know? it's and like we knew you, the consequences. It's like you said earlier. I mean, dude, it's a, it's a business and like performance is what makes money. And if you're not performing, like, yeah, you're not making money. money. Yeah. Huh. Check it out, dude. Believe it or not, you can get hurt hunting too. Yeah. Jared's missing oh, a finger. <laughs> that was my wedding ring. Got caught on a tree stand my first year of marriage. So did you like fall out? Not quite. I was hanging it. I was hung, I hung. It was a hang on stand. I hung the first stick, hung the second stick, climbing down to get the third. I was maybe only like a foot off the ground. And I, when I let go and I kind of leapt, like I said, I was only about a foot and just, it got caught. Here's my rubber ring. Now it got caught right in there and just my body weight pulled it like most, most There's of the way no, off. So you must've had a real ring on. I had a real tungsten ring on there. Yeah. Nope. No, nope. <laughs> that's off. Oh shit! I'd, I'd I'd joke with you, like your wife, be like, "You did this to me." Oh yeah, <laughs> this is your oh, fault. Yeah. Well, I yeah. was uh, I went into like surgery, so because it didn't come clean off. Basically, there's an yeah. artery like on either side of your finger, and one of them has to be in intact to supply oxygen to your finger so that it can live. And so they're probing me and stuff, and I went into surgery, and they're like, we're going to try to, like, recover one of these things, and I had all kind of rehab and stuff. But my wife was the one that they're like, hey, we, you know, no luck. You know, what do you want to do? And she's like, take the whole arm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pull pull the plug. He had a good life. <laughs> pull the plug. Where's the plug? They're like, that, they're like that's the TV. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. I got it. <laughs> Oh uh, shit. Uh, well, listen, Trey, we appreciate you coming on, dude, and sharing that with us. Um, you know, obviously with your free time, if you ever are in the neighborhood of Kentucky or Ohio, Jared and I've got some farms over here to, to come and hang out and hunt. And, and we've got some pretty good deer out where we're at as well, or Turkey or whatever the hell you want to shoot. So cool. Thanks. All right, dude. See ya. All right. See ya. Very cool. Oh yeah, man. It, it's, uh, you know, Obviously that, you know, a guy at Trey's level in terms of where he played and I mean, he was drafted in the first round. I mean, he was in, he was, was an elite athlete in, in the space. I mean, he was one of the best corners in the league, you know, for, uh, especially coming out of, of college. And, you know, I always think it's funny when you know how you and I are so ate up with this stuff, but it's because we've kind of just been in it the majority of our lives. And so when you see a guy like Trey, who, you know, he fished, he was in the outdoors, but he really didn't get into that, that hunting and, and aspect of things till substantially later in life. You know, it's, it's interesting to see how, like, you know, he's walking away from football for other reasons too, but because he sees that as this is what I'm going to do now. Um, and I just, it, it's kind of crazy. Like, I think, you know, guys like us probably, and a lot of people listening could see us doing that because we've been in hunting and it ate up with it our entire lives. But for him to kind of come in later in life and, and see that as like, that's his, his next after football life is like, it's kind of crazy. Well, it's a whole new world. Like, and it's not just hunting, you know, it's, 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 I would imagine anything is like that, you know, there's levels of like, mm-hmm. uh, of understanding or like intimacy with the, the sport or the, sure. the, the lifestyle or whatever. And it's, it's interesting to see, like, you know, maybe we can perceive where different people are at with that. You know, we, we talk to a lot of people, that hunt right mm-hmm. and we're like okay you know we kind of get a gauge for like where where somebody's at like in their their journey of just mm-hmm. you know and it's not like we're anywhere near a finish line not, not that there is one no you know but it's just that's what i said earlier was like it's cool to see somebody embarking on the journey of like you know now he has the time to just experience uh, yeah who he is like as an outdoorsman which is pretty cool well and i think the other thing that was good and it tied in really well to one of the past podcasts which was you know we kind of questioned the fact of like you know um, the balance between an outfitter running a business and managing a healthy herd and property. And it's like, well, who can do that? Trey can do that because of the amount of land he has, because of kind of the restrictions he's has in terms of how he's hunting those farms. 
I would assume if you look at that from a, a high level, he's making good money running an outfitting business and he's being attentive to the herd quality as well. Um, at least that's how it seems, you know, per, per what he was saying. There. Yeah, I'm sure they're trying. Everybody, um, I think everybody's trying, you know. But I think, you you know, he also owns 22 farms in Buffalo County. Like, that's a substantial yeah, amount of acre, land. Acreage definitely helps. So it, it is a, it's an interesting thing, you know, I think as he sit, kind of sees that layout. And, um, I mean, obviously, just the pure investment in that land, you know, I think is insane. Like, I mean, that that is a... a to, to me is a very very smart investment um particularly if there's people I mean, yeah, coming in for 500 an acres getting offered 11 th- yeah yeah you're pretty, in the right spot that's pretty good roi <laughs> yeah i mean and so th- those are the things i think you know and he obviously has money into those properties to transition them to where he's getting offered 11 but you know i mean dude from a land investment and again it's not just because we're saying you know ditch all your stocks don't do any of this it's just it's you know, timing. land, land, if you can do land as an investment, I mean. It's op- it's opportunity. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't go and buy Trey's property for $11,000 and then hope to, in a relatively short period of time, like tur- turn, turn a big 20. profit on it. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's it's been yeah. done, you know? Yeah. So it's situational. It's it's opportunistic. You got to, mm-hmm. you know. But it's the difference between buying land as an investment. It's any, in, it's any investment. Did you got to have the foresight to be like, where, you know, where's, where's it going? Where's yeah, it where's next? it going? Buying land as an investment or buying land because it's the final asset that you want to enjoy, right? Like yeah. if you and I buy land as an investment or trade does. It, and, could, it could be both. It's hard to have the foresight for yeah. that. Like you could buy a property that you think is like your forever property. And then, you know, somehow it, it you know, whether you got oil and gas on that or, or whatever, like it, mm-hmm. it yields a, a big profit that you're like, man, may, maybe I could grow from this. I could, I could get more acres. I do think that, you know, maybe not in, in his case, but like if you bought a piece of property for three grand and let's say you sold three grand an acre, you sold it for four grand an acre, that person 10, 15 years from now will still be able to sell that and make a substantial profit without a doubt in my mind. Oh, sure. You know, so it, it is. Well, that's the, the fact remains, you know, they're not making any more of it, you know, regardless of the status of it or. That's why I feel like it's somewhat recession proof. I'm not saying that prices won't ever dip or, or you know, stop growing because I think they are right now. Um, but because of the demand and the, the quantities are decreasing, you know, it, it things are being developed, things are being subdivided, um, you know, it, it's going away and the demand is increasing because of the need for access. I mean, the the price is always going to somewhat over a, a trending period look increasing. Just in always long, in the long term, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you'll have little ebbs and flows in in the short term, but in the long term, it will always be a, an elevator going up. Um, it always has been. Yeah, it's just that's just how it's going to be. So, pretty cool though. I mean. Um, you know, one of the reasons, uh, obviously, we wanted to hear kind of Trey's story is, you know, it's unique. You've got this football player. So during during playing for the NFL, you know, he was investing in land. You know, he's coming into hunting. He's looking at it as a business decision and stuff. And you just, it's unique. You just don't see it very often. But, um, you know, obviously happy for him because it seems like, you know, he, he's definitely satisfied with the decisions he, he's made and, you know, enjoyed a fall to where he didn't get the shit kicked out of him, basically, <laughs> um, is the way it seems like. Yeah. Well, uh, that seems like the trick is, you know, with professional sports, it's like, how do you make enough money to get out before you get hurt too badly to enjoy the rest of your life? Yeah. Crazy. So, um, cool. Well, that was awesome. Uh, anyways, we appreciate you listening to this episode of Hunter Podcast 126, Nick. 126. With Trey Waynes, and uh, we will see you all next week. Later. It take me all-